we'll go ahead and get started, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's pre-conference workshop for WCET's 33rd annual meeting. And we are all here virtually from across the country, and we look forward to being face-to-face -face with you next year, hopefully in Denver. So we have a great discussion today about all of your favorite policy topics. And Van Davis, the Chief Strategy Officer at WCT is going to kick us off. As we go through, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the Q&A within Feed Loop, and we'll also be watching the chat. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, Van. Thanks, Megan. So it is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. I'm coming to you from fairly sunny and warm Austin, Texas. Uh, but as Megan said, we've got folks from across the country with us. We are joined this afternoon by Russ Bulin, the Executive Director of WCET, who's coming to us from, Den from outside of Denver. We have Cheryl Dowd, who's the Senior Director for Policy Innovations, that's coming to us um, Ohio, correct, Cheryl? Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> uh, Dayton, Ohio. We've got Catherine Kerensky, who's coming to us who's the Director for Digital Learning Compliance, who's coming to us from Kentucky, I believe. And then finally, uh, Rachel Stokowiak, who's coming to us from the East Coast, Massachusetts. Is that right, Rachel? Beautiful Bay State, correct. Excellent. So we're really excited. The way this is going to work is we're not gonna give you some sort of canned presentation. I've got a series of questions to ask these folks. But we also want this to be as interactive as possible of a session. So as you have questions or thoughts, put them, as, as Megan said, into the Q&A. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll be taking questions as we go. We have a number of regulatory topics that, and policy topics that we're going to touch on this afternoon. Um, we're going, and those include talking about the regulatory process, professional licensure, um, regular and substantive interaction, military related issues, as well as data and privacy and OPM. So it's quite a wide range. So we're hoping that you came to us with all of your policy questions that uh, you have this afternoon so that we can put these experts on the spot and have them share their expertise. I'm gonna start um, with Cheryl Dowd and asking Cheryl a question about the regulatory process um, to kick us off so that we're all working from the same songbook as they say. So as you may remember, we had a set of regulations that came out in 2019 from the 2019 rulemaking. Some of those came out in 2019. Some of them came out and went, or excuse me, some of them went into effect in 2020. Some of them went into effect this year in July of 2021. And that came out of the 2019 rulemaking that actually resulted in consensus, much to many of our surprises. Uh, but it was part of the previous administration. So Cheryl, I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about that process and whether or not you think that those are going to be changed or removed by the current administration? That, that is a very good question. It's a rather loaded question, actually. Um, we know that the Biden administration uh, would like to use rulemaking because we've seen rulemaking already begun. Um, the Department of Education uh, last spring um, released their first intention to rule make, and that's on borrowers issues. And that rulemaking actually got started um, in October. And right as that was beginning, we got the notice of a second um, intent to rule make, and it's going to be about the 90-10 rule. And um, right now it's in a public comment period that ends today. Uh, so they anticipate that the rulemaking will uh, begin again for that one in uh, the um, January of 2022. But I have heard two different experts talk about whether we will see business education, accreditation, approval issues come up in another rulemaking. And so um, we know that the department may like to see another rulemaking, but at this time, we don't know what that third rulemaking may actually entail. Um, and we probably won't know that until spring. They're going to get the 90-10 rule rulemaking up and running. But I will share with you, I think it's important, the department has done a, a good job trying to keep things in um, a specific location so that people can follow it more easily. I'm trying to get to my chat. Um, and so what my suggestion is, is for you to check out um, this page, bookmark it, and uh, you can follow the rulemaking um, that will be um, 
uh, coming in this next uh, year and a half or so. So um, to your point of whether we see that the uh, these regulations, specifically people ask about the professional licensure notifications, and we'll talk more specifically about those, but people wonder, would those go away? And, and our thought is, is that we know that this department is going to be very consumer protection um, oriented. And so the fact that those might be brought back really does not seem like a likely um, occurrence. Um, we're all about consumer protection. These rules were put in place, you know, to protect the student and to provide transparency. So we believe that these will stay in place. Uh, but I do urge you to, um, to follow the rulemaking process long process if you all think about it because by the time you get from notice of intent to to rule make to um, the actual start of the rulemaking to consensus and then there is a time period from the time the proposed rules have public comment and then final rules and then it has to if it's by november one of us of the year then it can be um, available july one of the following year but if it's beyond november one it's an entire year after that so this rulemaking process takes a bit of time so the rules that are being discussed right now are not going to come into at least 2023 that's excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. And that actually is a really wonderful segue to talking about the first set of those rules that you mentioned, and that's professional licensure. And so, Rachel, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, that, that 2019 federal rule expanding professional licensure disclosures went into effect in July of, of 2020, and it continues to be one of the most requested compliance topics within WCET state authorization network. We're over a year past the implementation date. What's the climate right now? What is contributing to hurdles or frustrations for institutions? And are there some common myths tied up with this policy area that's impacting progress right now? Yeah, thank you, Van. All good questions. And Cheryl, you set me up so nicely on that too. Um, you know, I think we'll continue to hear um, some confusion and angst from institutions around this requirement. Um, seeking approvals on a state-by-state -state or profession-by-profession -profession basis, um, and then issuing accurate disclosures to that effect um, is no small undertaking, um, but it is really critical. Um, so maybe I'll share um, three ideas around that. Um, and the first, just a, a quick sort of combination, myth-busting and reminder about the climate we're working in. Um, you know, the common framing and connection that we center upon um, when we talk about professional licensure disclosures over the last two years um, has really been tied to the federal narrative and that you know, there is a tie to, to Title IV eligibility and, you know, it exists. That's, that's real. Um, but before we can even really get to what the federal language is asking institutions to do, um, we have to remember that this is a policy area that's overseen by states um, and respective uh, professions. So. You know, state entities are charged with protecting the interests um, and needs of citizens in particular localities. Um, you know, I like to know that my doctors and nurses know what they're doing and they've acquired those requisite skills before they prod me. Um, and, you know, just given the fact that um, states hold these significant um, responsibilities and the regulatory role, and not all of our states are the same, you know, there will be variation in standards, fees, programmatic approvals on uh, the edu education and training end. So um, it's a complex area and we understand that. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is, you know, students and professionals will move around. Mobility is a big thing in our society now. This can, this is difficult to begin with. It will become uh, more difficult to manage. Um, and the 2019 rule isn't an insignificant change. So the rule requires that um, institutions who participate in Title IV programs um, issue disclosures for all programs um, that either are advertised um, or designed to meet educational requirements for a specific uh, license or certification in order to practice that profession. Um, so disclosures are no longer uh, limited to distance learning programs um, that we may recall tied to the Obama administration. Um, so this language is now housed um, in institutional information um, under 34 CFR 668.43. Um, and you can read the specific notification language within the, the subsections A and C of that. Um, so for those who grappled with um, this requirement for distance learning purposes, um, for those who hadn't, there can be sort of a steep learning curve. 
Um, and we've heard loud and clear from many of our members that um, this change to all programs, um, you know, either doubled or tripled um, sort of the number of states and programs that they're now responsible for um, uh, issuing these, these disclosures. So it's an important reality to digest, I think, for senior leaders um, who may not sit in the weeds of sort of the state and federal requirements on the day to day. Um, and a second point I might offer, you know, sometimes we get caught up with um, some misconceptions um, in terms of compliance and what's covered by uh, participation in the state authorization reciprocity agreement, SARA. Um, and it's important to um, emphasize here, you know, the SARA manual reiterates that, um, you know, it has no um, effect on professional licensure requirements. Um, so an important distinction there is SARA uh, enables institutions to place students in learning experiences without triggering higher education um, agency approval in a particular state, um, but it doesn't impact um, the oversight of the respective professional licensing boards that, that stays within that respective state agency. So institutions who benefit from participation in SARA um, need to really study and address um, those policy expectations on top of what they're doing for state and federal compliance. Um, and one last takeaway, and just to, to tag on to what Cheryl had already shared, you know, um, this is um, a federal administration who is very uh, consumer advocacy focused. Um, and, you know, that aside, this still remains a state uh, requirement. So, um, you know, the federal rule is not going to go away. It's a priority of the administration. States have required it. They have long required approvals. Um, you know, it's just important to get started. Um, and I'm sitting here today with, I know, two veterans, Cheryl and Russ, um, who have looked at this policy language for years. So they can feel free to, to supplement or, or dovetail on any of those thoughts. Thanks, Rachel. That is incredibly helpful about professional licensure. And we're already starting to see a theme emerge, which is the regulations we have probably aren't going away, which is a nice segue to another set of regulations that has gotten a lot of attention. And that's regular and substantive interna uh, interaction. And Catherine and Russ are going to be with us, are here with us today to talk about regular and substantive interaction. And I, I know we've already got a question in the Q&A about it, but before I jump to Mark's question, I wanna ask a couple of general background questions first. Um, and Catherine, I'm gonna start with you if that's okay. And that is, could you just tell us a little bit about what the significance of regular and substantive interaction are? What are some of the key elements? Why, why should we care about regular and substantive interaction? Yes, uh, regular and substantive interaction is a critical component of the definition of distance education. And it is needed for a course to be distance education rather than correspondence education. And that distinction is important when it comes to uh, access to federal financial aid. So institutions could risk losing access to student financial aid if more than 50% of their courses are classified as correspondence courses or more than 50% of their students are enrolled in correspondence courses. Um, and again, if institutions found to be out of compliance, they could be required to repay the financial aid that's associated with those courses found to be correspondence rather than distance education. So the department defined these terms recently and in the preamble to the regulations, including those definitions, they outline the five factors that they will focus on um, when they're essentially reviewing regular substance interaction. The first being that the institution's online instruction is delivered through an appropriate form of media. That's defined in the regulation. Um, the second is uh, the instructors with whom students regularly and substantively interact, they meet the requirements for um, the institution's accrediting agency's um, requirements for instruction. Third is um, instructors engage in at least two forms of substance interaction. Those are listed in the regulation. Uh, it's a list of activities regarding instruction, assessment, tutoring, and answering questions. And fourth is that the institution has established some scheduled and predictable opportunities for interaction and that they create expectations for instructors to monitor each student's engagement, um, and then they're responsive to students' uh, requests for instructional support. Uh, in addition, although there's not explicit guidance, I think it's important to note that these new definitions, it was the intent of the negotiators 
and the department to provide for some flexibility when it comes to a variety of instructional models. Um, I thought I would see if Russ has anything to add to that point since uh, he served on that committee and can kind of give some insights on the why the language was drafted as it was. Yeah, I think I, I think you've covered it covered it very well. And then some of the things that uh, uh, to remember that in, in the negotiated rulemaking that one of the things that uh, was a theme throughout the rulemaking was the tie to working more closely with the accrediting agency. And for some of these things that you will see in the regular and substantive interaction for some uh, for some parts of it that there uh, are, are ties back to working with your creditor and 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 uh, and what will what will work in certain areas. And I haven't seen anything, and I haven't heard of any movement about the creditors uh, giving further guidance on this. But I uh, I think that that will be part of it. But uh, um, that's that's probably the the only other thing that I would add right now, Catherine. So Catherine, you, you kind of alluded to this, but who's going to be checking to make sure that institutions are being compliant in all of this? Yes, that would be the, the U.S. Department of Education. Um, so they're responsible for enforcing the laws and regulations that are under their charge. Um, they're also responsible for interpreting the regulations within their charge. So that's kind of what we were getting at there. They define these terms. They may or may not issue guidance, um, further guidance on them in the future. Um, and then once these regulations are set and there's guidance, the department staff, they'll be responsible for conducting reviews and audits of institutions to ensure that they're in compliance. This could also be done through the department's Office of Inspector General, um, which sometimes conducts departmental reviews um, of the processes. Um, they look for you know, things like fraud and misuse. They issue reports that the department may or may not accept. There were some um, common audits that were done back on previous guidance of RSI that used to inform our, our guidance of that, but now we have the new regulations and the new definitions um, going forward. So, so we'll see how those are interpreted by the department and then their Office of Inspector General. And Russ, this is, this is actually, I think, a good segue to something you can provide some insight on. If you were an institution, what do you think institution, institution should be doing to comply right now? And what sort of evidence do you think institutions need to start compiling um, for any possible audits in the future? Okay, and there's a, a good dichotomy in the word interaction for people to think about when they, uh, when they work on this, that there's the federal financial aid version of interaction where they focus on what the instructor does almost ex exclusively. Uh, there's, there's just one small part where they talk about uh, feedback from the, from the students. So you need to think about that and then, uh, and then think a little bit separately, but not too separately about uh, good academic practices and then thinking about how you uh, create and engender uh, interaction within the classroom. And the reason I bring that up and it, and it fits with this, uh, question is, is that actually most of the time that if you are doing very good distance education, interactive pra practices, that you are actually meeting most of the requirements that you have for regular and substantive interaction from a policy standpoint anyway. And how do you show that? Because you, you have to sort of fast forward somewhere along the line in the next few years, your institution will undergo what's called the federal financial aid review, or sometimes called an audit. Uh, where, where they'll come in and they'll look and see what you're doing. And typically what they do is that they'll, they'll look at your policies and they'll say, uh, do you have requirements you know, for, for uh, faculty getting back to students within whatever the period of time that you think is appropriate uh, and can, uh, can, um, can back that up in some way? Uh, do you have a faculty development where you're talking with them uh, about interaction and uh, what are good practices and in inter interaction and then also what they what they should be doing to uh, meet that but so they're looking for these types of evidence of things that you have institutionalized uh, things that you have in there and that you can put in front of them and say look we look through what uh, you have said as a department we look through what our creditor says and that we did the best we could in terms of coming up with um, ways to develop our faculty, ways to work with our instructional designers, ways to work with our uh, policies to, to try to meet that and put that in front of them. Everything is a defense, you know, so you can, there's no, uh, 
uh, you know, you, you jump three feet high and that does it. No, there's, there's, there's nothing that says that you know, actually would do it, but everything is a, uh, you're showing proof of that we did what we best could in order to comply with this uh, regulation and to protect students. So I think that gets to a, a question that, that John Murphy has, has typed into the Q&A, and this might be a good time for that. Um, what he's asked is, what are some examples of ways that institutions are internally assessing for alignment with regular and substantive interaction? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. One thing we just saw that uh, our friends uh, at SUNY, uh, that they have uh, State University of New York, uh, and Catherine did a good good look at this that we may do something with uh, uh that they have their oscar uh rubric and you may want to look and that's o-s-c-q-r i think that's how you uh how you spell oscar in new york uh and so that's their quality review thing but that's when you may want to look at because what they did is that they re-looked at their rubric and have a whole section uh about regular and substantive interaction and what their what so here they have great evidence that can work across the whole system about here are things that you should be doing uh, uh, doing to do that, uh, to meet those regulations. Uh, I have heard, um, I, I know we did uh, something with the uh, California community colleges and several of those uh, were sharing with each other uh, during the session uh, saying, well, here's what, we, here's what we did is that we put up a, uh, we, that they have you know, either policies or professional development, the things that they've done uh, with their faculty. And so we've seen a lot of uh, institutions being very proactive in terms of trying to address this. I know, and we worked with our friends at the Distance Education Accrediting Commission and that they were, they were working hard and did a lot of sessions with their, uh, with their institutions as to how to get their faculty prepared. So that um, raises a, a question that, that Mark, um, Lentini has, has typed into the chat, and that's, what examples do we have of specific pedagogical activities that might be considered regular and substantive interaction? You know, we've got the four bullets of the definition, but they aren't very specific. And so I'm wondering if, if you can either talk a little bit, um, either Russ or Catherine, about specific pedagogical activities that might um, fit into this newer definition of regular or substantive interaction, and then maybe talk as well about um, what guidance or do we expect to get guidance from the Department of Ed that's gonna be more detailed. Catherine, you wanna start with that? Yeah, I can start to say um, in terms of guidance from the department, there hasn't been anything definitive. Um, again, there's the definition um, that provides some of the activities that can qualify or, or relating to assessment, responding to questions, direct instruction, um, beyond that, there's been a little bit in the preamble or in some of their, their webcasts where they indicate some things that might be acceptable, um, such as scheduled office hours. But when it comes to purely pedagogical um, approaches, nothing's been definitively said. Um, it is important to note that when you have these interactions, they need to be obviously of a substantive nature, which means relating to the course or subject matter. Um, so I would imagine that things that would qualify would be, you know, posting videos relating to the subject matter, having some sort of interaction around that, um, facilitating a discussion with students relating to the content of the course, obviously answering questions, providing assessments, and having detailed feedback um, on those assessments would be good starting points. Um, I would hope that there could be more guidance. Like Russ mentioned with the SUNY guidance, there's a lot of institutional examples where um, you know, it's people who are experts in doing this type of course design, um, instructional design. They have some examples. Those are always good resources to look at and see what other um, experts in course design have to say um, and how they interpret the requirements as well. Did you do anything to that, Russ? Yeah, I think you did well. There's all these things that the, the faculty does in terms of uh, uh, holding discussions or uh, or. or or doing all these sorts of things, assessments, that that is really what they look at. Yeah. And what I was trying to look up, uh, I should, should look at this up before and was trying to find was that, uh, I think the term, it's what academic engagement, I think is the term uh, that got, that was defined now. And I'll, I'll try to find that. They redid the uh, site that I was looking looking for it on and so didn't find it right away. But it's, a, but it's one of those things where that term is purposely 
uh, referenced within the regular and substantive interaction and that you go over to that. And then a lot of the things that Catherine has mentioned are uh, mentioned over in that area. And we'll find a link of that and then uh, put that out to everyone too. But that was one that prior to this, uh, that's actually one of those things that I really suggested that that was a term that had been used in a lot of places. It was defined in differently in different places and that we actually put into the definitions uh, uh, in code this time so that people actually know what you're talking about, just like the question here that, well, what, what do you mean by that? And so it gives a list of those things. And we've got one last question here on, on regular and substantive interaction before we move on from Mark as well. And that's prior to the 2021 rulemaking, uh, the department expected institutions to audit courses to ensure RSI, uh, regular and substantive interaction was present. Do we think that expectation is still in place or do we know yet? I've, um, I've not heard of an expert that maybe that's something that I'm not aware of that the uh, that institutions were supposed to audit. What I know does happen uh, is that when the auditors come uh, and the review team comes from the uh, Department of Education, that what they do is that they will uh, they will do a sampling of your courses and see what's going on in those courses. And they'll look at uh, what you have in the syllabus, what, you, what you've done with the faculty, what are the faculty actually doing uh, that they do that. I've not heard of a uh, actual requirement to, to audit, at least from the Department of Education. Catherine or Van, have you heard of that before? I have not. The only thing I'd add to that is they might ask to look at the LMS and see um, mm -hmm. interactions within the course yep. structure there with the individual students. It, it would verify the students were attending the enrolled and attended the course and then kind of look at some of the interactions and that's and the um the lms could be an additional source of evidence um for the interactions as well to kind of get to a, a previous question that we had excellent um so before we move on uh to military related issues with cheryl let me just uh, remind you Feel free to drop your questions into the Q&A. It's gonna be an awfully boring session if you have to um, just rely on me to ask the questions. Plus at some point I'm going to run out of our, our predetermined questions here. And then that means I get to put all of these folks on the hot seat and I don't know that they want that from me. So feel free, remember to put your um, questions into the Q&A and we're keeping an eye, uh, an eye on that. Let me move to uh, military related issues. And that's, let's start um, with Cheryl here with Isaacson and Roe notifications. Um, we know that there are notification requirements regarding consumer information required for students for purposes of an institution's participation in Title IV programs. Are there notification requirements that institutions must provide students who are receiving veteran benefits? Yes, there are. And I think what's really interesting is that um, these can be very different um, sets of circumstances, depending upon um, what type of benefits you're providing. And so it was really interesting. I was listening to um, a presentation by a, a, a well-known expert, who I won't mention his name, but he was talking about how the um, language that's used uh, for regulations and for the HEA and the things that support veterans benefits and the laws um, overseeing veterans benefits can vary just enough to be a very confusing to those institutions who are um, charged with the oversight of that for purposes of their students who receive benefits. So very specifically, something that came upon um, the institutions in the last year is the Isaacson and Rowe law. And that is not about just education. That's a small portion. It's about veterans. But there is a section about higher education. The section is 1018. There are a couple of other um, higher ed sections, but this one specifically, section 1018, is the codification and statute of the Principles of Excellence program that was executive order in the Obama administration. And in doing that, it's roughly that because they changed some of the verbiage and um, in putting it into law, they are actually having some complications with that. Some of it's consumer notifications, but some of it varies from the and so I, I urge people to have a look 
at section 1018 if they provide if they are have students participating in veterans benefits because uh, compliance with those requirements is um, for purposes of approval by your state approval agency uh, for the programs that you provide for the veterans. And so that section uh, provided the opportunity for a waiver for this year for compliance. So the law was enacted last January, compliance or a waiver were due by August. Uh, however, um, if there are some concerns, I urge the institution to review, um, I'll put this in the chat too, they have a specific web page um, devoted to Isaacson and Rowe questions. Um, and I'm getting that over and it will get put into feed loop for everyone. And um, also to reach out to your state approval agency. So um, in this, as I said, consumer information, specifically there is a section there, we're all getting used to the professional licensure notifications um, for Title IV purposes. This for veterans benefits purposes, it's a little bit different. We, we haven't been able to get a lot of guidance on that yet. Um, so I just, uh, I, I hold, I, I ask everyone to kind of sit tight because I'm also aware that there are two bills in Congress right now um, that are going to address some of the complications uh, that came out in the language of Isaacson and Rowe. And I can give you an article to review um, by the American Council of Education on Education. And they did a very good job um, addressing what the questions are make sure I have the right URL there, um, and uh, how it needs to be addressed by the um, by Congress, because it's going to take congressional action to adjust some of the language um, in order for institutions to be in compliance. So I don't multitask very well. So I'm trying to copy and talk at the same time. And as you see, that is like a flat out problem. So. Um, so I'm, I'm providing this here. Oh, gosh. And it's got like the longest URL in history. So, Van, what is the next question? While I, while I fumble with this and. Uh... No problem, Cheryl. So the next question also has to do with military benefits and specifically monthly housing allowances. Folks, you know, folks that have been in this space for a while know that we have been issues about discrepancies in monthly housing allowances between face-to-face -face veterans and veterans in online programs. And so wondering, Cheryl, if, if you could talk a little bit about what differences there are in those monthly housing allowances for students who are participating in courses online, versus those who are participating in their courses face-to-face -face versus those who are participating in some sort of combination of online and face-to-face. -face. And fortunately, this question, I have just, you know, we prepared for this, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago and, and yet these things tied together so nicely in order to talk with you all today. Um, as I was mentioning, there are bills um, in Congress right now that are going to address a variety of veterans education benefits, one of which is this monthly housing allowance situation. The um, post 9-11 Veterans Education Assistance Improvements Act of, 19, of 2010, 2010 uh, provided that there would be monthly housing allowance for uh, students who are participating in online. But if they were participating in solely online, then they were only entitled to approximately 50% of the national average. Okay, that's approximately 50%. So there is a designated point that today is 850, I believe, dollars a month um, for full time. And um, that is uh, regardless of where you live. So I was looking at it and there, the, um, there are opportunities online that you can see different locations. Um, of what the housing allowance will be um, based upon whether you do your programs online or face-to-face. -face. Because what we see here is the rule, the law indicates that if it is solely online, fully online, then they are only entitled to approximately 50%. If an institution um, is offering the student, if the student can participate in, the, in a program and have one course in a, in a term uh, be face-to-face, -face, then the face-to-face -face, 
um, amount, which can be up to three times. I was looking at what it would be for Northern Virginia if somebody who, um, if a person was assigned to the Pentagon living in Northern Virginia, perhaps taking courses from Northern Virginia Community College, and they have one course face to face, but the rest online, it was well over 2000 for the monthly uh, housing allowance. But if they were taking courses solely online, it was approximately 850. So there is a gross discrepancy there in terms of what the what the different uh, costs could be. Um, but I point all this out to you because during the national pandemic, which we are still in, um, there were some flexibilities that were created by Congress after the pivot to um, uh, to remote learning occurred in March of 2020. Uh, Congress acted quickly because the law, as I mentioned before, um, indicated that, that um, if it was solely online, um, solely by distance education, then um, the uh, amount of monthly housing allowance is reduced. So Congress acted quickly and provided um, flexibility and waivers in place. Um, until, and Isaacson and Rowe, our old friend, pops in because initially it was until December 20th of uh, 2020. And then um, Isaacson and Rowe extended to December 21st of 2021, which is coming up in a little over a month. So I know that Congress, from these bills that I was sharing, uh, is trying to address that. Um, to see that this uh, flexibility can be extended um, until the end of the national pandemic, which would uh, mirror what the flexibilities that are provided by the Department of Education at this time. So I, I urge everyone that if they're, um, they have students who are receiving veterans benefits to keep an eye on our work because we will continue to update um, uh, where that is and following these bills right now um, and hope you know, that we'll be able to share with you all that these flexibilities have been extended and also that the um, uh, technical errors is what uh, one um, one uh, author of an article indicated the uh, Isaacson and Rowe issues are. So we will see some of this um, coming into place uh, in the next month or so. And let me ask you a, a follow up question on that, Cheryl. You know, Congress right now is challenged shall we say, around passing bipartisan legislation. Um, but in the past, they've been pretty good around passing bipartisan le legislation around military and veteran benefits. Do you think that that's still going to hold true? Do, do we have a good chance of, of some of this legislation potentially being passed, do you think? We, we do have uh, a good idea that because this is a bipartisan um, situation that they will be able to move forward on some sorts of action um, in regard to veterans benefits. Whether they will extend the monthly housing allowance is a question mark. Um, however, um, these Isaacson and Rowe issues will put uh, the institutions in, in danger of not having appropriate approval for their program. So they have to act on that. Um, there was a Senate committee um, on Veterans Affairs hearing just last week. And so I'm looking for some outcomes that would come out of that. Um, but there were definitely compelling uh, arguments shared um, in that from the guests at the hearing. So we're looking forward to that. And, you know, with Veterans Day around the corner, I'm really hoping that that coincides with some good news um, from those that are receiving veterans benefits. Thanks, Cheryl. That's really good insight. Um, before we move on to some other topics like data and privacy and OPMs, there's a question that uh, Shannon Riggs has typed into the Q&A here that I want to bring up and see if anyone would like to take a crack at. So what Shannon writes is, what can you tell us about the 21st century distance education guidelines um, from NC Sarah? NC Sarah seems to have tabled these a couple of times now. What do you think WCE team members should be watching for? So maybe if somebody could talk a little bit about those 21st, what, what Shannon's talking about and, and whether or not you, what do you think we need to be keeping an eye out for? Cheryl, I wonder if we should split that and one of us talk about the accrediting side of it, one of us talk about the state side of it, and, and which would you like? Let's see. Um, I, I don't mind taking the state side of it. I think, would you please start with a little history um, to find out, you know, to share from the CRAC moving towards the 21st century, please? Yeah, we... Way back in the last century, <laughs> that uh, WCT worked with the uh, uh, CRAC, Council of Regional Accrediting uh, Commissions, and that they came up with these uh, uh, CRAC guidelines for distance education, which were 
used by all of the uh, what were regional accrediting agencies that they were used uh, as documents that could be uh, given to their uh, review teams, uh, accreditation review teams as they went to the institutions. They were never requirements that you meet, meet, all, meet all of these things. And they were last updated in 2011. Uh, they uh, got uh, ensconced into uh, uh, NCSERA policy uh, as something that institutions had to, uh, uh, had to attest that they were uh, following those guidelines. And so they just had, a, had to have a, either president or uh, vice president, I think it was, uh, sign off that they were uh, doing that. But the, uh, the problem with the 2011 ones that uh, you may have noticed that there's been a lot of uh, changes and improvements and things in distance in, in distance education since 2011. Uh, it's amazing what can happen in a decade. And so, uh, uh, you know, it was great that you know NC Sarah stepped up and thought, hey, we need a an update of this, and uh, and uh, worked with the uh, I keep want to say formerly regional accrediting agencies uh, uh, that that worked with them and created something this uh, 21st uh, century guidelines. And so. It needs to uh, be understood that uh, even even now that they would be guidelines versus any sort of criteria uh, that would be used by the accrediting agencies. That, that if uh, we've had a couple of accrediting agencies who have decided to adopt them, but adopt by adopting them, that still means that they're just something that could be used for guidelines or something that uh, questions that could be used by the reviewers uh, uh, when they go out there. We, we know of two accrediting agencies that will probably never officially adopt them uh, because that they don't have different guidelines or criteria for distance ed versus any other type of modality. Uh, and that would be HLC and middle, middle states. And so uh, we're kind of at this point where they're sitting out there. They are um, an update. Um, I, I, I know there's, there's some things I would change in them. I did, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, uh, in that, but I'm sure that's probably true of a, true of a lot of people. And then uh, with that, that's from sort of from the historical and accreditation side. Cheryl, do you want to take it on the uh, from there? Sure. So on the the state side, it's once they're um, adopted by uh, the NC Sara board, then they would become part of NC Sara policy on the Sara manual. Um, and so the question remains how to execute um, these requirements. And so if they're part of the uh, SARA application and renewal, what then is the role of the, um, the state in the oversight um, for those uh, guidelines? And what is the responsibility of the institution and what are the consequences for not meeting them? And so there seems to be some questions still about how, um, well, first there are questions substantively as, as Russ indicated, but there are also questions about the execution of this and what the role is of uh, SARA policy and the implementation by the um, state portal entities. Um, you know who would also have a really good perspective on this if you don't mind me putting you on the spot here, Rachel, um, is if you have any thoughts about, um, you know, additional issues that we needed to look out for. I think everything you've, you've mentioned is, is so spot on. I think, you know, the fact that these have been tabled, um, I just impressed that this isn't, you know, a negative thing. I think it gives folks more time to look at these more deeply for states and institutions and NC Sarah. Um, their compact partners um, to really internalize the practical implementation um, uh, pieces of these guidelines um, and have a better sense or more clearly define how they connect to SARA policy and eligibility for participation. So I think, you know, taking more time is not a bad thing. I think as you uh, at your institution sit with these guidelines, internalize, you know, what you do to comply with these potentially um, or how you evaluate your processes, which support these guidelines. Um, ask questions of your states, ask questions of your accreditors. Um, I think um, they would appreciate hearing just practical perspectives um, from all sides of the house. So that's the only thing I'd add. And, and if I may, that Shannon's question was then what should WCT institutions be doing about it? That I think at this point, it's a helpful set of guidelines. Uh, and there are others out there. We mentioned Oscar before and QM and other, other sorts of things that are uh, out there as helpful guidelines. And you should take them as such that they're a helpful set of guidelines that are still 
um, NCSERA is going to uh, create a committee to look at them again in some sort of process that will be announced. But so they're a helpful set of the guidelines that are out there that are under review. That's really helpful, folks. Um, we're going to move on to a few other issues. And again, let me remind folks, as you've got questions, to please type those into the Q&A and, and we'll answer them as they come in. Um, but Catherine, I, I want to turn to you and, and ask you about data and privacy, which is something that doesn't always get as much attention as perhaps it should, but uh, is something that um, especially after the, the turn to emer emergency remote instruction and as institutions began to rely more on third-party providers, there's been more attention paid to data and privacy. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you think data privacy is emerging right now as an issue and what institutions should be aware of when they think about data privacy from a policy perspective. Yeah, that's a good question. I think you bring up a good point, Van, in perhaps the extra focus being given on issues like data privacy, um, given the increased use of remote learning, online learning, third party providers. I also think just from like a history of regula regulation in this sphere, um, since the European Union had their general data protection regulation, um, which is generally considered pretty broadly applicable and a very comprehensive data privacy law, that went into effect in 2018. And really since then, more states and countries have been considering, and in some cases passing, their own comprehensive data privacy laws. In the US, California is considered the first state to pass a law. And, and this year alone, uh, Virginia and Colorado have also passed similar laws. Other states such as Minnesota, Oklahoma, Washington state have considered bills or have bills under consideration. And at the federal level in the United States, Actually, in September of this year, uh, there was a discussion in the Senate committee on creating uh, a national data privacy standard. So I think it's clear that more and more jurisdictions are considering their own data privacy laws. Um, and these laws could have a reach that extend to institutions, businesses, or entities that are located outside of these respective states. Um, I think an important consideration um, for institutions to keep in mind is that these laws do contain a, a number of exemptions. They have minimum thresholds that would trigger their applicability. Um, so they may or may not apply to your individual institution. Um, and some of those factors might be how much data you collect or process within a state, whether you sell data and other factors like that. So I would encourage institutions to review these laws as they pass or as they're being considered and then review the potential applicability um, with their institutions council to see if they need to do a deeper dive into the requirements in these individual states. Mm -hmm. And if Thanks, I can Catherine, add just one really... thing, sorry, Van, to add oh, one please. thing, um, you know, there, there are existing state by state laws um, governing data breaches in particular, which is a, a hot button issue. Um, and I think one we'll see is, you know, post 21st or not 21st century, um, post pandemic, you know, we're all having, you know, new, new touch points in our digital services. Um, you know, there's a lot to, to learn from this, a lot to be seen still. So I think being aware of those data breach laws and what that means for your institution is a big thing. No, that's really helpful, Rachel. Thank you. So uh, sort of keeping on this topic of some issues that are taking on perhaps new urgency. Um, because of that pandemic shift to emergency remote instruction. Russ, I'm going to um, put you on the spot and ask you about OPMs. Um, there have been a lot of consumer protection issues raised about OPMs. We think that we maybe begin to see an uptick in the use of OPMs, particularly in recruiting incentives. Um, what should we be looking for from this administration whenever it comes to these um, OPMs? And, and maybe you could say a word too about just in general what they are and, and how they operate. Sure, yeah, let's start with that, that with the o, uh, OPMs and, and there's uh, uh, various uh, spinoffs of that term and in terms of online program management that, that really what an institution is doing is that they're probably identifying that there are some uh, services that either they don't have the capacity or that they don't do well and that they're outsourcing to another uh, to a company to provide some of those and it could be 
uh, marketing, it could be recruiting, it could be instructional design, it could be building um, building whole programs, and in uh, uh, some odd instances, it could be even uh, getting faculty and doing that. So it's a, a whole host of different things that uh, could vary on the uh, what the uh, provider provides and what the institution uh, needs. And sometimes those are bundled together that you have to buy the whole package. And sometimes they're unbundled that you can uh, pick and choose uh, uh, from the menu uh, on those. And that uh, and there's been um, um, consumer protection worries that are very real in terms of uh, uh, Van had mentioned about some of the recruiting uh, practices were uh, uh, not so great. I guess uh, that some of the, some of these used. Uh, I know I, I had uh, um, uh, and right before the pandemic, I'd went gone to two uh, meetings where I had in different conversations had people say, uh, "I wonder who's in charge, us or the OPM," uh, and that's kind of a bad a bad thing. Uh, and then the uh, and then the uh, what else? So anyway, that there's you know things that could be at OL and others that institutions got themselves into contracts that were probably unwise and couldn't get themselves out of. Now, I've said all the negatives there, but there's a lot of positives, too, that there's a lot of places where uh, you, institutions have treated students very well and that this has expanded what they could do and uh, that they have very good management and oversight of it and that they've done very, very uh, well with it. And so I don't I don't mean to say that they're all negative, but what's happened is that uh, among consumer protection groups and federally, uh, that there's the uh, Senators Warren and Brown were looking into this issue. Uh, Government Accounting Office is, uh, has a report that's supposed to come out any time here now uh, looking into this issue. And my, uh, I suspect <clears throat> that that report will come out and that there'll be uh, some sort of action that will come uh, out of that. And probably the thing that would be easiest to do out of that is that in 2011, there was a what's called a um, uh, dear colleague letter that allowed for more uh, more actions to be taken in terms of uh, uh, student recruitment and, and how much uh, incentives that, inst that the OPMs could get out of the student recruitment. And that was allowed and that, that is something since it wasn't passed by Congress, it didn't go through rulemaking, it was just through dear colleague. But that's probably the thing that could be changed uh, the easiest out of this. And I think we could maybe see some other uh, changes or interpretations coming in the next several months. Uh, so I, it's one to watch because uh, uh, there's certainly those who are now in the department who are very interested in this issue, wrote about it, a lot about it when they weren't in the department. And um, we'll see what happens there. It could uh, uh, change the business model for uh, quite a few institutions who uh, rely, rely on them. Thanks, Russ. And while I've got you on the spot here, we've got a clarifying question from Yolanda Cunningham, and that was, uh, did I hear correctly that some accrediting agencies will not adopt the 21st century guidelines, which will not? Well, it's, it's and by not adopting them, it, 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 they wouldn't adopt any, any distance ed guidelines. And so, uh, and that, as I understand it, I so I can't speak for them, but my understanding is that HLC, Higher Learning Commission, North Central, and also middle states have gone to um, gone to uh, the mode that they review programs and institutions regardless of modality. So what that means is, is that uh, uh, they expect the same sort of quality, same sorts of student services, same sort of uh, support for faculty, et cetera, et cetera, regardless of what the modality is. And so they have tended not to use uh, um, uh, separate distance ed guidelines. However, we were on a, a, a session just recently uh, where Karen Solomon from HLC said they will take them and put them on their website and have them as a reference document that if somebody wanted to use them, that, that they would still be there. It actually ends up being almost a technicality because it's essentially how the others are using it as well. It's a guideline, it's not a requirement. And so, um, it ends up being sort of a technical thing, but all of them would, would make it available to re, uh, a review teams that go out to look at institutions, should that review team want to use it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. 
So I'm going to invoke executive privilege since we don't have any more questions in the Q&A and ask a closing question since we're, we're coming close to the top of the hour here and ending our time with, with this esteemed panel. And so here's my question for, for all of y'all. What should folks be watching for in 2022? What do you think is gonna be the most important thing for folks to track as we go into this next year? Um, hopefully in the tapering down of a pandemic. And Cheryl, can I pick on you to, 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 to answer first? Oh, and you come right to me. Okay. Well, actually, the thing that came to my mind, honestly, had to do with accessibility, because I think, you know, there was so much that had been done initially, um, you know, just to make sure we got programs out there. And um, I think we're powering back to try to make sure that we're providing good quality, accessible um, courses for our students. So I think that that's something that is the, the time of, Russ uses the time of forgiveness is ending. Um, the uh, having to do with what the, um, the department had offered as flexibilities and waivers, because even the department indicated that accreditors could implement their requirements um, ahead of that, that the department is just saying that's for purposes of Title IV, but the accreditors can say, we need this in place now. So I think it's, it's having to do with accessibility and quality of programs. I would add a little bit more um, to what Cheryl said, just to kind of emphasize, um, I would expect a lot of the things to look for is just more of the enforcement and maybe a little more guidance on the requirements um, clarifying expectations along those lines. The department, I believe a week or so ago, announced that it was kind of reinstating its um, enforcement unit that it has. So um, I expect that a lot of the upcoming years will be, you know, revising regulations in, in the line of the department's interpretation and clarifying that guidance on probably a variety of issues. Yeah, all those things. I think they'll want to know how you can show that you protect consumers and how states show that they can protect consumers. Um, and I think we can look at some of the backgrounds of the key leaders at the Department of Education and some of the staff that they've brought in, look at their research interests, um, prior advocacy efforts. Um, I think there'll be a heavy um, investment in transparency and consumer protection that's just gonna stick around. And that's not a bad thing. Um, me. And uh, Cheryl and I were tipped off uh, in the spring to a rule that came out in the at the very end of the Trump administration and was doubled down upon by the new administration. How's that for being on uh, for rule? And that had to, that had to do for uh, for accrediting reviews of distance education. That they, they used to always use the uh, fifty percent of a program. That the accreditors had to didn't have to review it unless it's fifty percent. Well, now the official rule is distance ed review for any program that is in whole or in part distance education. What does that mean? One course, really, or part of a course or a hybrid? But I, I'm, I'm curious to see whether that kind of expands out. We start uh, using regular substantive interaction and those sorts of things for uh, high flex, for hybrid, for some of these other sorts of things. I can't say that I know that's going to happen. It's just this feeling I have that from some of the things, I, some of the vibes I get that I wonder if there will be some sort of expansion of, of, of uh, the application of those rules. Well, and with that, Russ, you get the last, you get almost the last word. We wanna thank folks for joining us today. Um, Rachel, I think you wanted to plug some of the upcoming policy events. Yes, so we have two upcoming events that are open to WCET and State Authorization Network in December. Um, and these will be uh, a closer look and sort of the practical impl implementation side of two policy areas. One regular and substantive interaction um, that Catherine you're hosting on December, pop in, throw in the date for me there. December 1, thank you, Cheryl. And uh, then on December 8th, we'll have um, a second uh, special policy event focused on professional licensure disclosure implementation practices. So um, you can see those two events listed on the WCET website and please register and join us. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. And folks, we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon to talk about um, all of these policies and federal regulations. 
We look forward to you being a part of WCET's annual meeting tomorrow. Uh, we've got a fantastic lineup of keynote speakers and panelists, so I know it's going to be um, a really beneficial and some wonderful time to, to learn together. So thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>